My name is Ted Lucas, and this is the second of three lectures on the music of Lily Boulanger. I hope you saw my first lecture. In that one, we talked about Lily's early years growing up in Paris, and then her winning of the Grand Prix de Rome with her cantata Faust and Helen. She's the first woman in history to win that award. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about some of her instrumental music. We'll talk about two pieces for piano and violin, and then we'll look at one piece for piano alone, and we'll end with a piece that she wrote towards the end of her life, a work for full orchestra. So I hope you enjoy this. Thanks for watching. The first piece I want to play for you is one that she entitled Nocturne. It's written for piano and violin, or piano and flute, and was written in 1911 so she would have been 17 years old when she wrote it. I happen to have the original sheet music. Here it's in not very good condition, but this is published by Ricordi, published in 1918, so this is over 100 years old. The style of this piece is in the style of the Impressionists, like such as Debussy for sure, because um, she was heavily influenced by Claude Debussy. It's in the key of F major, and it's in 4-4 four, four time, but we really can't, can't get a sense of the tonic at the very beginning, because it begins with this ostinato figure on the note C. So we don't get a sense of the tonic until the third measure when the violin comes in, and the piano has these notes. So now we get a feeling of a, of a dominant seventh. So we, we kind of feel that this is going to be the tonic. And indeed it is. So from there, the piece builds and builds until we get to the first climax, which is the beginning of the B section. So after that climax, it comes back down again, and we come back to... And then she has the violin, quote, Debussy. Quoting another composer is fair game. And in this case, she quotes the opening measures of Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. Um, it sounds like this in, in her nocturne. In the, in the opening measures of Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, the flute solo plays this. So for many decades, Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn was considered to be the first piece of the modern period. Lately though, in the 21st century, um, music scholars are beginning to think that the Impressionist period was the, was the crowning achievement of the Romantic period, and that the beginning of the modern period um, was uh, with Stravinsky's Three Ballets. The, the Firebird, Petrushka, and the Rite of Spring. After that quote of Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, we begin to feel that the piece is coming to an end because it's slowing down, and we get a, a feeling of a dominant seventh, but then we get a resolution to this chord. A four that goes to one know what that is. That's the Amen cadence. And that's the way the piece ends. I hope that's not too technical for you. You really don't need to know any of this to appreciate the beauty of this piece. You can just close your eyes and let the images arise. Um, if you are interested in music theory, I will be running uh, on the screen um, the music, the sheet music, with my 
with my handwritten notes of the places in the piece I was talking about. So please enjoy Nocturne. The next piece we want to look at is also for violin and piano, but in this case it's a much different mood. The title of this piece is Cortege, and here I think we see a little bit of Lily Boulanger's humor, or even dark humor, because a cortege is a solemn procession, so it's like a funeral procession. But in this case, her cortege is a little dance. It's, it's very, very charming. The form is in the ABA song form, just like um, the nocturne we just heard. The song form is a very common form. It's called the song form because so many popular songs and folk songs of Europe and the United States are in this form. It's ABA. The B section is supposed to be a contrasting section. The contrasting section can be a change of key, a change of mood, a change of tempo, and then a return to the primary theme. The song form is frequently found in classical music, especially in the slow movements of symphonies, sonatas, and concertos. Usually, the return to the A section is altered in some way. It's lengthened or shortened, or in some way varied, so very rarely do you have an exact repetition of the A section. That's why the form is usually written A, B, A prime, as you see here. Also, you frequently find an introduction to the A section, and then at the end of the piece you often find a coda, a, a brief ending. 
And that's exactly what we have here in Lily Boulanger's Cortege. We have a short introduction of two measures in the piano, and then the violin begins the A section, and then at the end we have an exciting dynamic coda. So let's just hear a little bit of the beginning. <laughs> That's the first eight measures. And then we have another eight measures of that with a variation. And then the, that little theme begins to disintegrate. And then we get into the B sections. Here's what the B section sounds like. I can imagine that at the Via de Medici, uh, where she wrote this, that they had soirees and that she played, this was performed for other students as their compositions were performed for the group of students who were there. So let's hear the entire piece, it's very short, and I will just highlight in red the various sections as, as we go through the piece. Isn't that a delightful piece? I'll talk more about whole tone scale and tritones in my next lecture. Today we just want to go quickly through a little piano piece that she wrote in the same year as Cortege. But this piece couldn't be more different. This is called D'un vieux jardin, which means of an old garden or about an old garden. And in many ways it is at her most I would say progressive, because this piece is very much looking forward. The melody is hard to find. The melody in Cortege was so, so clear and so obvious. But in this piece, in Dans Vieux Jardin, the melody is not as important as the harmonies, because the, the, it consists mostly of chords that are unrelated to each other, sort of random chords. And to the extent that the term atonality is defined as music that has no tonal center, much of this piece is atonal. It's not dissonant. Um, dissonance and atonality don't necessarily go together. I mean, dissonance um, is found in a lot of tonal music, like Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and it's possible to write atonal music that is not dissonant, which I think is the case for most of this, most of this piece. So structurally, it's the same as Cortege, it's ABA. Um, in this case, there's no little introduction. It starts right off on the A theme, and then it goes to a B section, which is quite extended, and returns to the A section. The return to the A section is quite interesting. It's a long transition that has its own character. In fact, you could almost make a case that the form for this piece is A, B, C, A. 
um, but I'm going to stick with the AB, A prime, and coda. For a music theorist like myself, it's fascinating to analyze pieces like this, especially this one, because it gives you insight into what she was thinking, and what she was playing, what she was writing down. It's really revealing in many ways. The key signature is four sharps, and it's C sharp minor, and you would never know that it's in C sharp minor past the first measure, because it doesn't return to C sharp minor until about halfway through and then you get a C sharp minor chord at the end. But in between, you get chords of every color and every nature and every almost on every note of the scale. So these chords in this piece are unrelated to each other in many ways, unlike traditional classical harmony where chords all relate to the tonic. At times, it sounds like a little jazz piece. I mean, the chords sound like jazz chords. In fact, the great jazz pianist Bill Evans said that he got his ideas for his chords from Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel, and possibly even Lily Boulanger. But the main thing for a listener is how does this make you feel? What was Lily Boulanger thinking about when she gave it the title um, of, an, of an old garden? The fact that she gave it a title like that tells us almost immediately that it's an impressionist piece. She intends to give you her impression of an old garden. It would be interesting if we could compare this piece about a garden to another piece by Lily Boulanger that was about a garden. In fact, she did write a little piano piece called Dun Jardin Clair, which means of a bright garden. That's a very happy, very positive, upbeat piece. So I encourage you to look it up on YouTube when you have a chance. So let's just take a look at some of the highlights and then I will play the piece for you and you'll see the music with a lot of analytical markings. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you might, be, you might like to follow along. But if you're not, if you just want to hear the piece, you can again close your eyes and try to picture what Lily Boulanger might have been thinking about when she wrote this. So it starts off with these notes. Have we heard that before? Yes. It sounds an awful lot like the WC um, prelude to the afternoon of a fawn. So it begins on a D sharp all by itself, followed by a C sharp minor chord. And then it goes to a G11. And those two chords couldn't be farther apart from each other, C sharp and G. Harmonically speaking, I'm not speaking in terms of range, like the distance on the keyboard from C sharp to G. What I'm talking about is in terms of the chromatic scale, or in terms of chords that relate to each other, there is no chord farther away from C sharp than G. The A section ends on C sharp minor. The B section is very lovely. It's it, it really is in F major, so I would say the B section is not atonal at all. But then it's not long before we get back into the into the atonality of this piece and the, the long transition to the to a very short A section. The coda is quite odd. It it uh, follows a long descending chromatic scale in the bass. <laughs> sinister sound and definitely very sad. 
So let's listen to Dun Vieux Jardin. It's less than three minutes long. That's a very interesting piece. It certainly deserves listening to again. The last piece I want to talk about is one called De Matin de Printemps, or On a Spring Morning. She wrote this in January of 1918, a couple of months before she died. It was written for piano and violin originally, and then it was so popular that she wrote a little trio for piano and cello and violin, and Towards the end of her life, for the last few weeks, she orchestrated it for a full orchestra. We are going to start with the original version, which is for piano and violin, which I think is actually more interesting than the orchestra version. Um, it's easier to distinguish the two parts, the accompaniment from the main melody. It begins with an accompaniment in the piano for a couple of measures on these dissonances. A minor second, a minor second, and a major second. And it's in 3-4 time and it has no key signature, so we know it's going to be jumping all over the place in terms of key centers. So first, let's listen to the opening measures um, as performed by the great violinist Yehudi Menuhin. Following this part, which we will call A, there's a transition, and then we get to the B section, which is slower and much more melodic. 
This is what part B sounds like. And then as one might expect, there's a brief return to A, which goes like this. And now we might expect a coda, but in fact, we get something new. So we had A, B, A, and now this new section, we're gonna have to call C. And then the final A section sounds like this. So what we discover is that the form of this piece is not ABA, rather ABACA. -A -A. That form is called a rondo form. This is the standard rondo form. There are variations, but this is the main one, ABACA. But there's something that gives this piece away as a work by a mature, developed composer, as opposed to the early works we studied. It's not a traditional rondo. Here's why. The two slower parts, B and C, are not new themes, as in a traditional rondo, but rather permutations of the main theme. For example, the theme in section B is derived from the tail end of the main theme. And the theme in section C is simply derived from the beginning of the main theme. So a strong case could be made that this is a monothematic composition, supported by a variety of transitional material and plenty of references to the ascending scale in the middle of the main theme. This is certainly a thoughtfully constructed work, like every great composer, she's an architect, a musical architect, not just a writer of pretty tunes. So just before she died, she orchestrated this piece. This is what the orchestra sounds like when it plays the introduction and part A. Here's part B in the orchestra. So let's hear the coda. Let's hear it with the piano and the violin first. And now here's the coda with the orchestra. If that sounds familiar, it should be because it was the music for the opening slides of this presentation. I'm not going to play the whole piece. I'll leave that up to you. There are many recordings on YouTube. I recommend that you begin with the piano and violin version and then listen to the orchestration. What a great piece. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I hope you will watch my third lecture. In that lecture, we will talk about the music that Lily Boulanger is most known for, and that is her choral music. So I look forward to seeing you. Thanks for watching.